Chapter 58 War Against Midian Part 1 Numbers 31, 1-12 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Afterwards shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. Of every tribe of thousands, throughout all the tribes of Israel, shall ye send to the war. So there were delivered out of the thousands of Israel a thousand of every tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them to the war, a thousand of every tribe, them and Phinehas the son of Eleazar the priest, to the war with the holy instruments and the trumpets to blow in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites, as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. And they slew the kings of Midian, besides the rest of them that were slain, namely, Evi, and Rechem, and Zur, and Hur, and Reba, five kings of Midian. Balaam also, the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captive, and their little ones, and took the spoil of all their cattle, and all their flocks, and all their goods. And they burnt all their cities wherein they dwelt, and all their goodly castles with fire. And they took all the spoil, and all the prey, both of men and of beasts. And they brought the captives, and the prey, and the spoil unto Moses, and Eleazar the priest, and unto the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by Jordan near Jericho. Numbers 31, 1-12 This chapter is regarded by some as the most infamous in all the Bible. Enemies of the faith have over the centuries made routine use of it. It is important for us to see, first of all, who the Midianites were. They were a nation related to Israel. In Genesis 25, 1-4, we see that their ancestor was Midian, a child of Abraham by his second wife, Keturah. 1 Chronicles 1, 32-33 Moses' first wife had been a Midianite woman, but her father, Jethro, had separated himself from Midian and was a man of God, a priest. Exodus 2, 16-22 the Midianites lived by raiding, and in Judges 6 to 8, we see their habit of coming in at harvest time to strip the people bare of their harvests. The Midianites were close to the Moabites in their culture and outlook. In Numbers 25, when, at the Council of Balaam, the women of Moab and Midian involved the men of Israel in their fertility cult rites, we see that the woman killed by Phineas was Cosby, the daughter of Zur listed in Numbers 31.8 as a king over one of the Midianite city-states. There were various clans of Midianites, some more peaceful and later friendly to Israel. Those now before Israel were peoples dedicated to raiding and to fertility cult practices. Alan Edwards said of the Midianites that they were sex worshippers, and their women very promiscuous. However, very little research has been done on the subject of Midian, and fertility cults in general have received too little attention by scholars, despite their widespread prevalence. Perhaps the subject comes too close to home, and it also vindicates certain things in Scripture. There is another gap in our knowledge here, a medical one. No attempt has been made to trace the relationship of fertility cult practices to the spread of venereal and other diseases and epidemics, although, in answer to a question many years ago, one scholar admitted that there were doubtless many connections. He expressed no interest in the problem. Given the rapid rise of numerous sexually transmitted diseases 
as a result of the sexual quote-unquote revolution of the 1960s and on, it seems curious that no serious consideration is given to the long history of certain practices and their consequences. This chapter is regarded as highly offensive because God here commands the destruction of the Canaanite branch of the Midianite people. Any move against the ungodly and criminals is unpopular with evil peoples. A man whose inner affinity is to evil will tolerate evil more than the good. This is the problem with modern juries. Their sympathies are too often with the criminal. In some cases, even with rapists. Justice cannot function in the abstract. It requires a godly people as judges juries, and citizens. God makes it clear in verse 3 that this is really his war. It is against the Canaanite Midianites. God assumes the initiative and the responsibility for this war. Since Balaam was one of those slain, verse 8, it means that he had either returned from his home or stayed on in order to strike at both God and his people. It seems clear from Balaam's presence that more assaults would be made on Israel's faith, character and existence. There is a remarkable aspect to this campaign. It was a sudden strike against a hostile Midian, which, however much it may have been preparing a new strategy, did not expect Israel to take the initiative. We are told, verse 49, that not a single Israelite died in this campaign. The campaign is called the Lord's Vengeance on Midian. That nation's effort to pervert all Israel into fertility cult practices had incurred God's wrath. God does not take apostasy or sin lightly. We read in Exodus 32, 9 following, and in Numbers 11, and in 1411 following, that God was ready to execute all Israel except for Moses' intercession. James tells us that The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16 Who is now ready to pray for our people and for their redemption? We must remember, too, that in spite of Moses' intercession, all the older generation, save two, were sentenced to die in the wilderness. This was not an obliteration of all Israel, but it was a great judgment. Because this was a war ordered by God, Phineas, son of the high priest Eleazar, accompanied the soldiers and was, to a degree, a leader. Verse 6. The battle was a successful surprise attack. In an age of total war, it is hypocritical to condemn the attack on Midian as wrong. Balaam is listed in verse 8, together with the five kings of Midian's city-states, as among those slain. Given the legal language of scripture, this means that Balaam had gained high status in the Midianite councils of state. Balaam's counsel that the Midianite women make themselves available to Israelite men in fertility cult practices had led to a plague that killed some 24,000 men, Numbers 25.9. We know from history that a people with no exposure to any new disease, venereal or otherwise, often have no resistance to it. Israel, after almost 40 years in the wilderness, had no such immunity, and as a result, succumbed to diseases which the seducing women themselves had much tolerance to. In the late 1940s, I saw the death and very serious illnesses created by measles on hitting the western Shoshone Reservation. There had previously been no such epidemic, save one in 1911. Isolation had protected them. Balaam had cleverly found a means of not only corrupting Israel, but also killing its manpower. His presence with the kings indicates that more of the same strategy was being planned, perhaps more deviously the second time. 
Baal Peor is the Baal of Peor, essentially the same god as Priapus, to whom all virgins had to prostitute themselves. It was a naturalistic religion whose premise was, in Alexander Pope's words, whatever is, is right. It has been a faith advocated in our time by Lenny Bruce, Hugh Hefner and many others. Calvin's comment is pertinent. Amongst the other prerogatives which God conferred upon his church, this one is celebrated, that he armed the godly to execute vengeance upon the heathen, to execute upon them the judgment that is written, Psalm 149, 7-9. And although the Spirit declares that this should happen under the kingdom of Christ, still he refers to ancient examples, one of which, well worthy of remembrance, is here recorded. The Midianites had organized a wicked conspiracy for the destruction of God's people, and God, in undertaking to punish this cruel act of theirs, gave a striking proof of his paternal favor towards the Israelites. Whilst his grace is doubled by his constituting them the ministers of his judgments, This passage, therefore, shows us how anxious God was for the welfare of his elect people when he so set himself against their enemies, as if he would make common cause in all respects with them. At the same time, we must observe this additional favour towards him, that, although the Israelites themselves were not without blame, he still deigned to appoint them as judges of the Midianites. Inasmuch, however, as he everywhere prohibits his people from indulging in the lust of vengeance, we must not forget the distinction between men's vengeance and his own. He would have his servants, by patiently bearing injuries, overcome evil with good, while, at the same time, he by no means abdicates his own power, but still reserves to himself the right of inflicting punishments. Nay, Paul, desiring to exhort believers to long-suffering, recalls them to the principle that God takes upon himself the office of avenging. Since then, God is at liberty to execute vengeance, not only by himself, but also by his ministers. As we have already seen, these two things are not inconsistent with each other, that the passions of the godly are laid under restraint by the word, that they should not, when injured, seek for vengeance or retaliate the evils they have received, and still that they are the just and legitimate executioners of God's vengeance when the sword is put into their hands. It remains that whosoever is called to this office should punish crime with honest zeal as a minister of God and not acting in his own private cause. God here instructed the office of vengeance upon his people, but by no means in order that they might indulge the lust of their nature for their feeling ought to have been this, that they should have been ready to pardon the Midianites, and still that they should heartily bestir themselves to inflict punishment upon them. A key verse in this text is verse 6, which orders Phineas to lead the way and to blow the holy trumpets. This means that the war was fought with God's blessing and under his orders. Both Jewish and Christian commentators have struggled to explain away this chapter or to, quote-unquote, apologise for God. Given the evils that our present age both perpetuates and tolerates, this is arrogance indeed. Such people will not allow God to require judgments. As a result, we live in a time of God's judgments upon the nations. In God's universe... Men may tolerate evil, but then God moves against all such men and their evils. 